Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon our meditation on your word today, that the collective meditation of our hearts and the words of my mouth are well-pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What is the biggest debt you owe? For most of us, it's probably a house, maybe, if we're just thinking in terms of finances, that is. But you can owe things besides money. And maybe for you, you can think of a debt that you owe, a large debt that isn't money, but is bigger to you than money. Maybe it was the sacrifice a friend or a family member made for you in order to be well. I know of somebody who was a pastor, uh, he was a vicar at our home congregation when I was in high school, and a few years back he gave one of his kidneys to one of his parishioners because he was a donor man quite the debt. Or maybe it was somebody who made a sacrifice for your future, paid for your college or gave you an opportunity to succeed that you otherwise wouldn't have had. Or maybe you were the benefit of adoption into a loving family. But family is a great image here because that helps us understand that Even before we get to the debt that we owe God, nearly all of us have a debt that we can relate to what Jesus is talking about here today, and that's a debt to our parents. Well, I promised the kids some numbers here. So right now, this is the average cost of raising a child from zero to 18, $233,610. How many of you guys have paid your parents back yet? But even more so, the sacrifice of a parent is they sacrifice their own lives, energy, time. Maybe they won't take as nice of vacations because they have children. Maybe they take a career deviation or miss a job opportunity to raise their children. We owe our parents a lot. And most of us haven't paid that debt back. Well, maybe it's not that simple. Maybe our parents knew something, or maybe something about being a parent is intrinsically like the kingdom of God. Let's find out. Well, whatever debt came into your mind as I asked you that question, I want you to keep that in your mind as we go through the parable in our gospel reading today, the parable of the unforgiving servant. Now, over the last couple of weeks, Jesus was confessed by Peter as to be the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus praised Him because His Father in heaven had revealed this truth to Him, but then He goes and tells His disciples what God really has in store for His Messiah and the way the kingdom of God is really going to work And it's misunderstanding after misunderstanding after misunderstanding with the disciples. And poor Peter, before you pile on Peter too much, Peter is often just the spokesperson for the twelve. It's not as if the eleven over here understood what Jesus said and Peter is uniquely ignorant. None of the disciples understand what Jesus is telling them. So ever since he's revealed... God's plan of salvation that's going to take place in Jerusalem and what the Son of Man must suffer and that He must die, misunderstanding has abounded. And today it continues with forgiveness. The disciples don't understand the nature of the forgiveness that God is bringing into the world through His Son, Jesus. And you know what? We don't either. Our parable is prompted by a bad question. Those seem to be abounding lately. Last week, the disciples were arguing like children, and then they came to Jesus and said, Jesus, who is going to be the greatest? You can almost see Jesus shaking His head. And here again, Peter asks a bad question. Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? 
Let me translate that for you into a way that you might ask that question. How many times do I have to forgive this person? And if you think that question through, what is it you're really asking? Well, this is one of those questions about what can I get away with? What's the minimum amount I can do in order to be acceptable? And you can imagine Peter is really hoping for an answer that's not too much higher than seven. But these types of questions abound in church even today. I hear them all the time about different subjects. You can make any subject a question like this. One of the most common ones is about baptism. Do I really need to be baptized? What if I genuinely believe in Jesus? I don't need baptism then, do I? Because the Bible says it's belief in Jesus that saves. To which the proper response is, while technically true, it's a bad question. You should be more concerned with what God is asking you to do. And He says, get baptized. So you should get baptized. And that's really Peter's mistake here. It should be him asking a question about what God wants him to do, not what can I get away with doing. But we're like that too, aren't we? Think of somebody who's wronged you over and over and over again. Our mind almost naturally goes to the same place as Peter's. How many times? How many times must I endure this sin against me and forgive it? Well, Peter's sorry to find out that Jesus' response is not a small number. Jesus responds by saying, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, some of you math people out there might be like, Got it, 490 times. Thank you, Jesus. Brother, you're at 476. You've only got 16 more, 14 more to go before we're done. Now, clearly, that isn't what Jesus means. Jesus uses a big number, a number that really nobody's going to keep track of because that's not the point of forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't keep tallies by definition. And then he further explains what he means by giving this number by going into the parable, the parable of the unforgiving servant. And I have to say, this is one of those words of God that has stuck in my head a lot of my life, and sometimes not for the right reasons, but I always, it always is one of the first scriptures to come to my mind when I haven't forgiven someone like I should. And sometimes the motivation is I don't want to appear to be as petty as this guy because once I share with you some of the number equivalents of what's going on, you'll see he's extremely petty. But it really is a great passage on forgiveness. Now, notice that the, this parable begins with this statement from Jesus, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to. As I mentioned to the children, I think when Jesus talks about forgiveness, we think of our own internal disposition that it's, this is something I should be doing. And that's true. But that's not all of what Jesus is saying here. The radical nature of the forgiveness that is being brought into the world by Jesus is far greater than what exists inside you when you become a believer in Jesus. It's simply what happens in His kingdom. That what Jesus is doing in forgiving you your debt is bringing you into a kingdom where people do not pay what they owe. It's just the way things work there, which is why it's supposed to be like that here at church. We're supposed to be a small outpost of this new kingdom in the old world, and it's why it's so hurtful when it doesn't work out that way. So the kingdom of heaven may be compared to so we set the opening scene here. This is verses 23 to 25 if you want to follow along. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. 
And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So far, seems pretty consistent with what we'd expect in this world. And just to give you a few numbers here, so biblical scholars would say a talent was the equivalent of 16 years' worth of wages. This guy owes 10,000 of those. That's 160,000 years of wages. It's a lot. And I looked up what the average annual salary in Pennsylvania is today. It's $50,916. or $50,916. And if you multiply that by 160,000, you get $8,146,560,000. Give or take a few cents. That's a lot. Jesus chose this number because He wanted you to know that the debt that's owed to the king can't be paid. Not if you had a hundred lifetimes. Which makes it even more funny what the servant says in response to what the king tells him. He doesn't say, forgive me the debt. What does he say? He says in verse 26, The servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. The king knows he's not going to see that money. But again, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to, tells us that this is a place where people don't pay what they owe. So after he pleads, even though he doesn't really know what to ask for, Verse 27, and out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. So we have an impossible debt that can't be repaid, and the servant, even in his pleading, doesn't even ask for the right thing. He's still under the illusion that somehow he can pay this back if just given enough time. And yet the master gives him not what he's owed. The master's not fair, although usually when we say that, we're referring in the other direction, because nobody complains when it's unfair in your favor, but he's forgiven the debt. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's a place where debts, even impossibly great ones that can never be repaid, are not paid by those who deserve to pay them. Instead, they are forgiven. At most, you could think the greatest mercy offered in this old kingdom would be a granting of the servant's actual request. Okay, I'll give you forever to work off this debt. But the king goes even further in his grace and releases him and forgives the debt. So what Jesus is describing here to His disciples is the new reality that He is bringing into the world, a foretaste of what is to come in His kingdom. He's describing a world of forgiveness, a place where forgiveness is just done because the whole event that sets off the birth of this kingdom is the paying of the greatest debt in all creation by the person who deserved to pay it the least, our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And in that great act of cosmic mercy and kindness given to each and every one of you, a new place was made, a place where God and His people have been made right, a place where His people have been forgiven and a place now where they live forgiving one another. Without Jesus, this is impossible, and you can't really blame Peter and the other disciples for not really understanding what's going on. Who could? I mean, this is unbelievable. That's a lot of money. The king just decided to forgive. We don't do that here. But Jesus does, and that's what He's teaching His disciples, and that's what He's teaching us, that here, that is what we do. 
Can you imagine? I mean, I've had times where like I was worried about a test or something and I didn't study very well and then I get it back and I actually did pretty good and the relief you feel and you just want to go like skipping down the sidewalk. Can you imagine this guy's feeling after like he was thinking at best I'm going to get, you know, some extra time to pay this off and he got it forgiven. He had a new lease on life. He's probably doing cartwheels. But what happens? Let's see how he responds to the mercy of the king. Verse 28, but when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. Hmm. Just for a little context, the denarii is a day's wage. So he was just forgiven 160,000 years of wages, and he couldn't forgive someone else for less than a year. He wants to go back to the other kingdom now, the kingdom where people pay what they're owed. How petty can you get such a small debt in comparison to what you've been forgiven? How could he do something so terrible? Because this doesn't just harm the person he's seized and choked, it harms him. Because he wants to be back in the old kingdom. So, word gets around, gets back to the master, the king. Verse 29, so his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. Does that sound familiar? Almost verbatim the very words he had spoken moments before to the master. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. But when his fellow servants saw this, they were greatly distressed. And they went back and told the master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Now here's where the kingdom of God being a place of forgiveness I think is key. Because if forgiveness is just an internal disposition, there's no explanation for why the king is rescinding his forgiveness. Because in fact, that's not actually what he's doing. He's merely granting the will of the wicked servant to be done. The wicked servant wanted the benefits of living in the kingdom of heaven, but didn't actually want to be there. He wanted to go back to the old kingdom. And so the master says, if you want to go live in a place where people pay what they owe, I'll take you there. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. One of my favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis, he says that the gates of hell are closed from the inside. And that if you get to heaven, it's thy will be done. And if you go to hell, it is God saying to you, thy will be done. That you're the place where you wanted to be. You wanted to be in the place where people paid what they owe at least when it came to getting what was yours. And Jesus is telling His disciples, that's not what happens in the kingdom of heaven. That's not what happens in my kingdom. In my kingdom, people don't pay what they owe, which is great news because do you know who you are in the story? You're the unforgiving servant standing in front of the king with a hopeless debt, And according to the law, what waits you is being sold and imprisoned and tormented for the rest of eternity in payment of that debt. But dear friends in Christ, this isn't the kingdom of the old world anymore. It is a new kingdom in Jesus. And here people don't pay what they're owed Jesus took that that fate. 
in your place. So that as you gather here each Sunday and plead mercy before God for your sins, that hopeless debt is forgiven. Your chains are gone, as we sang moments before. They've been removed by the King Himself. And Jesus closes with this. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. You've been brought into this new kingdom in Jesus, a kingdom where God's Son dies an unjust death in your place for salvation, where the smallest and least are the greatest, and where forgiveness is a natural part of things as natural as breathing. That's just what we do here. Here in this kingdom, you forgive because you have been forgiven. No debt you owe, going back to where we started here, that I asked you about, can come close to the debt that you have been forgiven. And thinking of your parents, you get a small taste of what this feels like. Things haven't been corrupted by sin to such a degree that now parents keep tallies and then they require you to pay back to them everything you owe them once you hit 18. There's a reason for that. That's not the way God intends things to work. He's just making that more full and free in Jesus. Instead, you receive forgiveness. A grace that's both unearned and one you didn't even know to ask for, yet given just the same. So today Jesus speaks of a great joy and a great calling for us. That joy is the reality that I will affirm again to you today. You have been forgiven all of your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You now live in this new kingdom where people, including you, don't pay what you owe. For the King has shown you mercy in Jesus. And the calling that He's placed upon you, you're in. It isn't to get you in. It's just now what you do. You show that same grace and love that you receive from the King to all of those whom you call brother and sister in Christ, so that that joy, that freedom may abound. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, given in the forgiveness of your debt, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until He comes again and we're fully in His kingdom forever. Amen.